From the legal, let's look a bit at what infrastructure looks like across the country. Dilapidated state of infrastructure is getting aggravated daily thanks to the rains and the floods. This has raised a lot of concerns for the citizens. And though the government says it's putting its best, it's doing its best in solving these issues, the question is how much is good enough? How best is the best. And it's not just about the federal government. It's also about the state. It's also about the local government. It's also about the citizens. How? The local government? Do they yeah. exist? Yes, they do exist. Oh. Mm, yeah. I quite forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> even the citizens. How much are the citizens even putting in to ensure that infrastructure that is given to them is taken care of? I mean, you wake up, you drive through a particular road, in the, in the evening or the day before. By the time you come the next day, you see a pothole. And sometimes it's deliberately dug by citizens who are hoping to market their produce. Okay, thank you very much. I did not call any name. <laughs> but be that as it may, what can be done in the face of all that? What can be done? Well, to help us discuss this matter, joining us from our Abuja studio is Tochuku Iheme, who's a social commentator. Okay, you will get to see his face shortly. But here in the studio, we have here, permit me to say, Chief Olade in the area. Yes, he has moved to, he's a high chief. He has moved to Banana. I'm still your friend. And also on this side, we have Evans Ufeli, who's a legal practitioner. Yeah, thank you, thank you for morning. joining us. You. And Dikbo Oyewale, who's a public affairs analyst. Thank you. Morning. Okay, I hear Tochuku is ready to join us. Tochuku, thank you for joining us. Hi. Okay, we can hardly hear Tochuku's voice, <laughs> but I'm sure he'll pick up shortly. But let me start with, um, it's a good thing that we have a mix of the elderly. Thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, so we'll start with, uh, let me start with you, Mr. Rio. What would you say is a state of, uh, I should say Chief, okay. Chief Rio, and Larry has reminded me. What would you say is a state of infrastructure now? Um, starting from, <laughs> what I would simply say is this. I grew up in a very good time and going around the entire southwest, seeing roads, they were made by Tifawolowo as the repair of the western region, still very much in use. And then over time, especially during the military era, roads were constructed that could not stand two rainy seasons. By the time 1999 came, politics came with all the shenanigans and the evil manipulation and machinations, it became worse. Now, what we are presently facing, for me, is a reflection of the wishy-washy jobs of our immediate past. Okay? If the roads made by Lowa way back in the 60s could still be motorable today, I wonder what happened to roads made 15, uh, 20 years ago. Some as late as six years ago, and then they are absolutely impossible. That's about roads. We've always been hearing since the days of military coup that our hospitals were mere consulting clinics. They are worse than consulting clinics today. Of course, if, if we want to discuss power, I'm sure people at home will shed tears. So much of our resources have been wasted, squandered, on power, but what have we seen? Darkness. And why? We just heard lately that some Nigerians now, not foreigners, shared some nine or something billion US dollars, you know, in contract awards. L little that is next to nothing was achieved and they've all been paid. So with all of this, I, I don't want to go on, you know, okay. with all of this. It will not be, I mean, it will be a surprise if things are better than the way they are. Okay. Mr. Feli. Yeah, when you talk about uh, public infrastructure, I think we all know where the problem is, like he has said it, and then that is established. I would like to talk about the solution. What can we do to remedy the condition? Like uh, one of which is that 
We talk about public infrastructure in terms of awarding contracts, but we don't talk about quality control. Now, that's one. We don't talk about quality control, the level of, uh, the kind of quality, okay, or the deploration of quality control engineers to ensure that what we have as deliverables are what it's supposed to be. Do, we, even, do we have quality control engineers? I like the... We do. Yeah. Okay. Be, once you award a contract, okay, it goes through the, the process, it goes through the public procurement and all that, then the issue, certificate of no objection, once that is... There should be within the process a quality control from the government, a quality control process from the government to ensure that the, the, what is awarded for is what is being delivered. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, angle, we don't look at it because in the process of getting the contract, most of the time, the, the authorities have compromised. When they compromise, they're expecting kickbacks. So they, they won't remember to look into the quality control aspect. They're, that not, is one. they're, they're not strict they about not the strict quality about control it. because they have been compromised. Yes, they're not strict about it, so the mm -hmm. rules are flawed from there. Then two, we talk about issue of uh, opportunity cost, prioritizing projects. You go to them, some states, you find a governor building an airport. There's no public health care in those areas. There's no roads. There are no schools. <laughs> there, are no, there are no roads. Okay? So when you, because this issue of prioritizing the project is also part of the problem. Because sometimes we think that it's because of the lack of funds or just the endemic corruption that is the major problem. Part of the problem is also is that the lack of understanding how to prioritize what is the most pressing need of the people as we speak. One of which will be education and healthcare. When you have those two, then you can begin to talk about okay, getting the roads so that and, you can have water. transport, so that you can have uh, water, you can have the, the standard of life of the people can increase. In an attempt to do that, the Umbondo uh, uh, Power Holding Company mm -hmm. they created more problem because the federal government still retained forty percent. <laughs> the TCN, the federal government now alone want to do the transmission. Federal government that have no capacity and competence in that area wants to handle the transmission. So what now, the, the, if you look at the second schedule of the constitution, section 13 and section 14, places power generation on uh, the, the concurrent list. And that concurrent list means that the states have the capacity to rely on that law. The, the law says that the National Assembly of those can make laws to generate power on areas not covered by the national grid. And that is what gives the leeway for renewable energy and every other kind of generation that you can have. But when you, even states that have developed the capacity, like Lagos State, say that develop the capacity, they still go to the federal government to ask for license. Whereas the constitution has already restructured that. And those are the problems we're having. That is because most of the attorney generals of state do not understand the provisions of the law as regards where power should be. We, should have, we have no business being in darkness because it's not what we think it is. We think that it is in the exclusive list. No, check the law. Paragraph 13 and 14 of the second schedule of 1999 Constitution has amended. I place that on the exclusive list, giving states the power to do that. So states can take, rely on that provision of the law enacted, you know, and then enact their own uh, the house oh, no. and then generate what power. about regulation regulating it that's what i'm talking about the, the, so the, we uh, talked about you NARC. talked about licensing the state is going to the federal government to ask for li for license yes. to generate power yes but if then if they shouldn't be doing that the question of regulation now comes in how what do you what we're saying that any roc is unconstitutional if you check because i cited the provision you understand the state have no business going to the federal government to ask for license because if you look at section uh, paragraph 13 and 14 of the second schedule of the constitution, it places power on the concurrent list. And then what the states are supposed to do is their house of assembly is supposed to make legislation to that effect. And then they carry on states where you have uh, sunshine, high rate of states where you have water, you can now develop your own different kind of... That is, the constitution has already restructured it. Well, here people see talking about restructuring. Restructuring in that area. Mr. Feli, then I'm sure there, there is a, there, there is a, we have lawyers aplenty in the various states' uh, houses of assembly. So, how come they're not seeing what you are seeing? They are seeing it. The problem we have is the attorney generals of the state who are supposed to advise the governors accordingly. 
Okay, it's, a, it's an open open law. Okay, then the constitution. So there are states who have uh, tried to because even the federal government went as far as creating a rural electrification project, no, whatever. Mm. You understand? What does that mean? When the constitution has given power to the states, has to assemble to make laws to that effect. What but, does but, that mean? Is that not the federal government trying to intervene where the states are failing? That's what I'm saying. That the federal government trying to do everything. Sixty-eight items on the exclusive list. You cannot find your bearing because you have no competence to even manage Abuja. You only want to manage everywhere. That's why I was saying that the, 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 the issue of the, the question of the kind of system, the kind of uh, federalism or the federal structure we practice, it's not federalism. Okay, it's a let's bring Mr. Iwale. Mr. Iwale. Okay, well, I'd like to bring it from the perspective of planning and in terms of priorities. Okay, I believe there's a huge failure of urban planning and fiscal development. Okay. Now we have issue of flooding in Lagos. I mean, there are parts of Lagos that um, you can only get from point A to point B only by a canoe. Okay, I find it quite disheartening that in 2019, in a state, uh, in a city that we claim to be a mega city, you have people who have to commute via canoe no, over it's roads. It's not a mega city. I mean, it's claimed, it's claimed to be one. We are progressing towards to be. being okay, so we're hoping, our ambition. We're, ho we're hoping to get there yes. and then to the smart mm. city that we're saying <laughs> we're hoping to get to. So I think there's, there's a huge failure in terms of urban planning and development, saying that, okay, this is where... Uh, there should be residential areas, commercial areas. It's, it's sort of a wild west where we have construction being done, where there isn't strong regulations. And even when the authorities that be come into play, anything goes, anything goes because, yeah. on, like he said, some folks have compromised on some level. And until we realize that um, our lives are at risk when we keep doing this, I think that um, certain things will not come into play. So I think that until we understand that certain planning needs to be done, because he spoke about having to do some checks with construction work being done. You got 10 billion naira to construct a 10 kilometer road. And we're not going back to check to say that, is it actually 10 kilometers? Is the, is it that, is it as, is, is the quality what it's supposed to be? So I think um, until we understand that proper planning, because that is a failure of planning as well, because if you had planned that into the system, then there shouldn't be that failure. But proper planning is why we're where we are today as a people, not just in terms of um, power and housing and flooding. You know, when you say planning, yes. there are a lot of people that will argue with you that, of course, we do plan. But I mean, we plan we... effectively. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So there's a, there's a planning process. Mm. There is a plan. The question is, is the plan executable? As, as it should. No, 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 no. It's not executed. Is it executable? Mm. Then you cannot say, is it executed? Mm. So the question is, when you say planning, now, at what stage are you looking at? Is it from the planning? The, what stage? Well, from, from, from the ideation stage, really. Because when, you, when you're putting pen to paper... You have to look at varying factors, okay? We're not going to have a conversation here um, on something I'm not versed about, okay? I'm not going to start talking about broadcasting, okay? That's, where, that's your forte, okay? So I'm not going to put pen to paper. But I believe the onus is on our leaders to understand that when you're discussing certain issues or you have certain challenges, you need to surround yourself with folks who are competent. Because even at the state level, you have chief executives of states. Uh, you're not expected to know everything. Okay, that's why you have a cabinet. That's why you have advisors. But we're expected to have people around you who are competent, who should bring to bear and put in pen to paper on the things that are current, on the things that are relevant, and things that are obtainable in the markets. Because theory is good, but like you said, it being executable is a different conversation entirely, mm. which is something we're getting to see. Okay, let's, let's see if we can bring it. Before you move to Abuja, I just want to make a little comment on what Mr. Yewole said. Mr. Yewole, I have a problem because I have noticed that we don't seem to acknowledge our limitations. Mm. Everybody wants to be president. Yes. Everybody wants to be governor. Mm. Because everybody thinks that they can do the job. Mm. Why can't we just look at our 40 and just stay within our areas of competence? Exactly. Well, I believe that um, it also comes from certain people believing that the current system has failed. Okay. So if, for example, if Chief Ariyo becomes a governor of a state today, and then he sees that, okay, you'll be good for Minister of Information. Now, he may also be very vast in the same field, but the fact that he's at the top, he's able to garner a collective of people who think like he does. So I think on some level, to be fair, that's why some people believe to aspire to certain offices like that. But without saying, um, 
like going back to what you said about us acknowledging what our limitations are, I think it's something that we're not quite strong at doing as a people, mm -hmm. <laughs> admitting that we have certain limitations. So I think that's a mindset that we might also get to need to change. Okay, we'll, we'll look at all of these things. But let, let's get Tochiku to weigh in on this matter. Tochiku, this, uh, this matter of infrastructure and how it's all looked at, what's your take? Um, basically, first of all, we need to examine three aspects of infrastructure. I noticed that we are emphasizing more, first of all, on the physical infrastructure. But we need to also look at the physical infrastructure, the social infrastructure, and also the institutional infrastructure. So for the social infrastructures, the one that has to do with the basic needs that we need, especially like sewages, um, dams, which we are now looking at all around Nigeria that is breaking down. Flood is almost becoming a recurrent um, issue in Nigeria. We also need to look at our institutional infrastructure, which needs to put plans, long-term thinking, short-term thinking, with regulations and all the frameworks of how each one of these three sectors must be tied together. Um, recently, I heard the Minister of... Um, um, finance, talking about the development plan that the government is trying to bring up at, about two days ago, and I think it's fine. But to tie up all these things, I think something is critical that the government needs to look at. First of all, the political will to ensure that they do that. Unfortunately, we are, most Nigerians are only losing confidence on the political will that it takes for the government to ensure that this is done. Even on the state level, certain governors are coming up and you can see them being extremely proactive um, recently, something happened in the southeast. You will notice that before from Abuja to, um, let's say, uh, an Enugu or Abia, we just take you six hours. As I speak to you today, it's a journey of over nine hours to ten hours journey just because of the bad state of our roads. So for me, I think we need to look at also the matter of funding because right now we need to start talking about funding. How do we bring these things up? I'm of the opinion that the government can't do most of these things because it's looking like it's overwhelming. They are not even showing the requisite political will because that political will is the most critical thing that they must trigger like a catalyst to ensure that it's done, you know. So if the government can provide this or the citizens can provide this by putting demand on the government to ensure that this is done, I'm sure that they, they can do it. Um, something happened um, recently um, when I was living in a, a satellite town in, uh, in Abuja here. And I rallied some people together with um, my friend in an area to say, let us fix the road. And honestly, the residents there were all cooperative. We, we were to raise about close to 15 million. And yet everybody was coming out to say, OK, let's bring our money. Let's see what we can do. It was just a government policy that said that that particular road, according to the master plan, is not a straight road, it's a vertical road. And that was what stopped it. So what am I trying to say? The citizens also, too, need to have a part. Maybe the government should bring up a forum where we are now going to have a PPP ar arrangement where both the government and both private people, they come into partnership and ensure that this is done. And for me, if this is going to come to place, then the issue of maintenance culture in Nigeria, we need to pay strong attention to it. Look at our roads. Can you imagine a governor that just finished one of the southeast um, states some few months ago? The road that he made is not even up to five inches thick. The whole roads, the whole roundabout in that particular um, um, state is all broken down. And I mean it. We just came yeah. back from Oweri some few weeks ago and we okay. saw the, of the of the road. And Totsuku, permit me to interrupt here. We need to go on a break. But I have to read this um, tweet from Sam. Sam says, Nigeria has not had it this bad. The state of the roads are scandalous, pathetic, and terrible. Festus says... Our infrastructure development needs massive investment and should be open to the private sector to be part of this high-profile sector. Um, government should mobilize our engineers to build our infrastructure. We have seen enough of these for of these in foreign countries. But see this, uh, Tochuku was talking about infrastructure. He talked about physical infrastructure, social infrastructure, and institutional. I want to add mental infrastructure. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment. Please stay with us. <laughs> We're still talking infrastructure. Remember, before we went on that break, we talked about all types of infrastructure, physical, social, and institutional. And I added a, th a fourth one, mental infrastructure. That applies to every citizen, every resident of this country, and even beyond the shores of this country. At the end of the day, one, th a few things we've, we've raised here. Planning, quality control, e prioritizing. The planning will include prioritizing. Um, execution and all of that. But Mr. Ariel, 
you started this. In fact, you actually went back to tell us what used to be. I do remember till now, they, when you enter the southeast, they would say, this road was built by Sam Mbakwe. This road was built by Sam Mbakwe. That was built by Sam Mbakwe. But it's not just about the road. A question of mental infrastructure, because I think that is, that that is what has killed our infrastructure. Maybe you picked the word from my mind, Ouch. and I'll tell you why. And I'll use this neighborhood as an example. Um, as a postgraduate foreign student, an old uh, sister of mine who was a top gun in the OPIC, about 30 years ago, asked me to come and buy land in OPIC, this neighborhood. And I sent money for two plus. And I bought what they call the exclusive, you know, GRA then. I came home on holiday and I said, look, can I see land. the land? There was no access into this neighborhood, okay? We were standing on the long bridge and then the man that brought me using a total light was now throwing stone to indicate the likely spot where my land would be. And there, there was water, water everywhere. I didn't need to be told that I was in for a long ride in the dark. Go to Abelkuta, and I told auntie, please, I want my money back. I wrote for a refund, and I got my money. Oh, you did? Oh, yes. They, they returned my money to me. Now, today, OPIC, the same place that I turned down, is housing, I mean, it's, um, it's, uh, you will go there and see massive mansions, palace-like private houses. Okay, what I rejected because of my mental infrastructure way back, some people ignored it, and all these things happened in the last 15 years. Remember, I used to live around that same neighborhood. Places that we knew were flood basins that were retaining water anytime it rained. Suddenly, from 2 million naira to 4 million, at the last count, they were going for 30 million naira per plot. People were desperate and they closed their eyes, they were buying. And when you tell them, hey, you are buying a, uh, a flood plain, they tell you, don't worry, I'll do rough foundation, German, whatever, Italian clinical. And they went on and on and on. What have we seen? About three or four years ago, we had to use Kenu to pass through the same Tunnels Avenue to some parts of Isheri North. Notwithstanding that, between then and now, we've had more developments in the same neighborhood. The question is, where, I mean, what happened to the people? Were they just anxious or so blind to what they were seeing that they must build and build in places that would never have been earmarked for residential estates? Is it not possible that the areas earmarked for residences are now too those, expensive see, for people to buy? Those who had, I mean, those who envisioned OPIC estates. They should be taken to court. They, they were do gooders who ended up doing nobody any good. The entire place today is flooded as we are talking. And there is nothing anybody can do about it. Because for as long as there will be flooding, I mean, there will be heavy rainfall that will cause the, the uh, dam mm. to be overloaded, yeah. which will warrant what are being released. For so long, they will continue having flooding here. It would have been different if, okay, you envisioned an estate in a place where you know it's waterlogged. Then you make a general and universal planning for water channels. But it was not done. So what you see are individual plot owners now trying to displace water, but still keeping water within the same community. And by the time they open the dam, what do you have? Massive flooding. More than half of the people in Cherry North today have left their homes to go and squat with some people somewhere. And let me tell you, whether we like it or not, it will continue like that. I don't know because I don't think they will now shut down the dam, okay, or something. Or maybe they, they might, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert in these things, but from what I know, even with the rainfall before they opened the dam, it wasn't nice. So we have to get the right mental attitude, as you said. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. You 
when you talked about you talked about you you went to the constitution as regards infrastructure and development of infrastructure. Let us look again at that constitution. What exactly is obtainable and at what level? Who's supposed to handle what? Is it that clear in the constitution? Yes, it is very clear. We have what you call for power, right? No, for generally roads, power, even housing. Okay, let's let's backtrack to section 14 of the constitution now. Uh, subsection 2 says it is hereby accordingly declared that sovereignty belongs to the people through which government derive by legitimacy, that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. Security and welfare. Security and welfare. That's the, that's the two pillars of governance. And then we, do we have a government that is aware or that is doing enough to create the balance between security and welfare of the people? That's one of the things we're talking about. It talked about mental infrastructure. Mental infrastructure is controlled by physical infrastructure. If you have a society where you don't have good educational system, you don't have good uh, uh, research, government don't fund research-based institutions, you are going to have citizens that have warp understanding about life. So they are going to go and buy water and build on it. They are going to go and do whatever. They will abuse even the infrastructure that government provides because they will reduce it to their level of understanding. Like when you go, sometimes when you drive on the expressway, you find some people defecating just on the expressway. Environmental impact assessment, which also affects, I mean, the, the pollution that they are creating there, which also affects people in their homes also count for life expectation in Nigeria. So what we, Socrates says that education is the ornament of prosperity and refuge in adversity. If government don't fund education effectively and healthcare, public healthcare, the problems we have, we will retain it for as long as we exist as a country. Because if you look at the Scandinavian countries, what happened in the early 90s, Netherlands, Finland, they invested massively in the early 90s into education. And today, what is the result? They are shutting down prisons because there are no inmates. In fact, as I speak to you, it's unreasonable to commit crime in Finland. Mm -hmm. It's unreasonable. It makes no sense because there's, there's no need for it. So they are moving workers in Iceland, away. In there's zero crime rate. Zero crime rate. Mm -hmm. So now they are moving workers from the prison, correctional, whatever, to other ministries because... The image that the warders are supposed to attend to, they are not. No, what did they do? What did they do exactly? <laughs> Can't we take that model? What did they do? They invest heavily, 40%, 50% of their budgetary allocation on education. By the time the human capital emerged, they were individuals who have competence, total men and women, came out from that policy. If we don't, if we have Nigeria, we have a, a budget that allocates four percent to education. Where are you going to? It's like you have a child that you did not take to primary school. You didn't send him to secondary school. You didn't send him to university. Thirty, forty years later, you are expecting him to come and rebuild your house. He will sell that house, destroy everything you have built yourself. You understand? That is exactly what we have. Look at our youths. I mean, look at even as I speak to you at my age, I don't know what good governance is. I have already read it in government <laughs> tells book. I've never seen it before. Exactly. I don't know what it is. And that is the honest truth. So it is a, an embarrassment on the citizens for the government to exist and they're not having that strategy to develop the economy. For the good, the constitution says the security and welfare of the people is the primary purpose of government. Look at the law of security, look at our policemen. Look at uh, the level of welfare. What social support do we have in Nigeria? Is it the, is it the, the, the what, the five thousand for poor, 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 poorest of the poor, what, or the, what do you call it, the social investment scheme that have no uh, uh, spread, that, that does not even take into account what, so, I mean, we are in a very big fix. And the only way out of it is to redefine the structure, go back to funding the basic need of, because Abraham Maslow's theory of need, if you have not left the first level, the second is not your priority. The physiological need, what to eat, drink, what to wear, shelter, if you don't have all that. And a lot of people spend the whole of their life trying to break free from that. 
and they still never get out of it. Okay, so we cannot be talking about space technology, nuclear technology. We cannot, but the world has gone even beyond that. We can't be talking about all that when we are trapped in this. The basics we are not going to address it. So issues like that, where, where do you start from? Okay. Um, well, Dickbo. <laughs> so Yusuf Mubarak says the political will is a major problem of our physical infrastructure. You can imagine in my state a certain underpass flyover, Quara, that was commissioned by the past, a past government has a portion of it broken down just three months after huge sums were invested in it. So political will. Now somebody else says to keep the poor I mean, to keep the people subjugated, yes. to keep them under, you, you have to keep them hungry, you have to keep them um, poor, you have to, yeah, you have to keep them blind so that they, are, they don't know where they're going. The question then is, are the people so, um, so in there that they do not know they need to break out, but yet they continue? You talked about some people all their lives are stuck in that what to eat what to wear, where to live, how to move. Are the people so in there that they can't even look at the way? And then it's from these same people that appointments are made into certain offices, and yet those same people continue to perpetrate what they complained before that was against them. Well, yes. How do we get out? Unfortunately, that's, that's a cycle. But um, I'd like to take it from where he stopped, about education. Um, and like the person rightly said, illiteracy, poverty, they are active tools to keep people subjugated because it is when you're literate, okay, when you're educated, you know to ask for more. That's when you know to ask for better. That's when you know that you deserve better. So that's when you get to ask for better, okay? So because um, somehow the Nigerian political elite, they are not interested in you asking for better because they're not interested in doing better for you. So they defund education. They defund health care. So even when you don't go to school, you don't know to ask, to say that, okay, the hospital I'm going to, I have to buy myself, buy, pay for the needle that I would need for my treatment, knowing that that is wrong, that should not happen. And then you have people dying off for that reason and they're just fine with it. They say it's an act of God. Well, it's actually a failure of government. So it's unfortunate that um, we've brought ourselves to this level La, but that. I ask a question. Mm. You, you, yes, so the government didn't do it. Yes. But from that same group of people, from mm. that same citizen, mm. appointments are made yes. by the political elite mm. that you call them. Mm. So these people are appointed. And when they come in, they continue to perpetrate what it is they were crying out against. Are they then... Is their mental infrastructure changing anyway? <laughs> Okay, well, well, I think... I their think physical that, infrastructure I, I, I might think, have I think changed. That's, I think that's but some, mental infrastructure some, has not changed. Some, somehow, in, in some cases... <laughs> let, me, let me quickly tell you. There are, so more, Nigerians, coming, huh? there are more Nigerians waiting to steal. Yes. Okay? Looking for opportunity to steal than those actually ready and determined to serve Nigerians. Mm. Quote me anywhere. So those characters you mentioned, the system as it is, has been so designed to sort them in Okay, where by all the ideals that the all the visions became blood, okay, and then they joined the bandwagon to enrich themselves. Which let first, me, first. Let me corroborate this. Mm. A former minister came on this program once and said to us that he came on a trip to Lagos. His hotel bill had been paid, the transportation he was going to use, everything had been arranged, his feeding, everything. And then his uh, PA or SA or whatever pointed to the boot of the car and said, and that's money for you to spend, sir, two million naira. And he said, I'm in Lagos for two days. All my expenses have been paid. What am I supposed to do with that money? Take it back to the treasury. A Nigerian did that. Hmm. How many Nigerians would do, would that? do that? So firstly, uh, before they get into the system, you also need to understand that these people are also products of the same system. Okay. Now, you would expect that because they've been complaining about this on the outside. Now they're on the inside. They ought to they effect do something actual about change. It. Um, well, somehow, I believe that um, a lot of people go into these places without strong convictions. Okay? I say convictions because um, it is quite difficult. It is challenging, let's face it, to swim against the tide when you get to certain systems. Okay? Now, we need to understand that this is a system that 
the norm is the abnormal. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you find that funny. But it's, it's unfortunately the truth. What is normal is abnormal. And um, when you try to come in with um, things that ought to be normal, you find that you're standing alone. So that's why on some level we also say that there need to be a critical mass of people who think in a certain way that is reformed you know, so I was, that I was going to say, we I'm could sure effect that, the change that together. Never got a second chance. Um, you're right. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> he would never have because he would have been seen as a renegade to say that, yes. come, this is how we dance this to this tune. This is how tune. we do it here. This is how we do it here. Yeah. Now, if you had rejected that two million and then goes back to the treasury, it could also raise a red flag somewhere for people to say, oh, so is that how they've been getting it? So that means that you're going to stop another certain, person from getting the five million. almost certain the money so you, didn't go back. So you need to be out. Not the money not, would not have gone back. That, not only that, he will have signed for two million. If he had signed for that two million, maybe 20 million naira would have been taken out. Yes. I was a, I was a resource person for a private agency some years back. And after each lecture, they would just give me 20,000 naira without signing any paper. Somebody now said, look, ask them for, I want to sign. That was the day I saw that what was, I was sent to do as a, as a resource person was 80,000 naira per paper. And for four years, they were paying me Twenty thousand naira, and that was the last lecture I had with them. They okay. removed my Somebody name. Somebody was pocketing sixty thousand. Yes, and they re after that day, after that session, I had four lectures. I was given three twenty because I said I wanted to sign. Before it would have been eighty k. That was the last time I ever taught anything in that place. They pushed me out of this place. Of course, you were bad news. Yes, yes. I became a bad. bad, bad I became a bad business. Bad business. As they say. That, that is adverse to accountability. So when you bring that into play, you can never last in it. So that's why we always say there needs to be a critical mass of people who think in that. Evans, in that Evans is very quiet. But <laughs> <laughs> come, go, go come back to Evans. Evans is not happy. <laughs> we cannot continue like this. This mm. has gone on for far too, too long. long. Too long. Yeah. At what point do we determine that we need to fix this country, including fixing our... Ourselves. Our psyche. Our, our, our mental, psyche. <laughs> plus, fixing our infrastructure. We need to get this country right. I feel the time has come for Nigeria to do what we need to do. Um, we need leaders I call system leaders. And what do they do, basically? Their job is to capitalize collective leadership across Nigeria in ensuring that we deal with what is happening on the ground. You are correct. We can't continue like this. Physically, I can tell you that Nigeria is breaking down by the day. It's already clear. We have a humanitarian crisis. Nobody is talking about it. We have a flood crisis. Nobody is doing anything proactive about it that you can say in the next five years, these things is going to stop. We have educational crisis that is coming up. And that's why I agree with what you said the last time of that we need mental infrastructure, mental frameworks of dealing with how we think in ensuring that we raise leaders, first of all, from the political spheres, because these are the people that give us the political direction. You talked about certain people who complain about this thing. When they enter into governance, they do the same thing. It's clear. What do you expect? When we don't have a strong development plan, when we don't have a strong strategic vision that we can say that with every quarter we can measure the progress, definitely we will enter this quagmire that we are. And for me, I think one of the things we need to realize is that the funding for this is actually available. But most times we lack not just the political, but the um, moral character and the also institutional frameworks, which, for example, like the judiciary or the EFCC, to ensure that political holders are really monitored in how they execute every cobble that goes into a job. For example, Pencom. Hold on, Pencom hold on. is just um, there. So to to, again, I will have to interrupt you, yes. but I will come back to continue with you how the EFCC need to monitor those that are in political office. But we also need to answer the question, who monitors the EFCC? We'll be back shortly. Join us again. Thank you for staying with us. Um, Tochuku. That you were talking about um, how the EFCC needs to monitor those in political office, how they, what they do, where they go. Please continue with your thought. Okay. So, for example, let me create a scenario. If I was the president of Nigeria, I would say for every minister, for every PAMSEC, for every director, for every um, contractor that gets a job, after your award letter, you feel you go to the EFCC, you make a, a declaration on how you are going to spend 
per time, every one naira that goes into any particular project. You know? So for me, if they can now monitor that, you said something very instructive, that who also monitors the EFCC? Well, you see that now is the reason why we need to put integrity in our systems. We need to put people of high moral caliber and character in our institutions, because it's institutions that are functional. That is why we talked about institutional frameworks, that we ensure that even the infrastructural delivery will be ensured. Now, that goes back to what you said, the mental infrastructure. Because if mental infrastructure is not put in place first, we can't get what we are, we are we're expecting. One of the things I was talk about that in just leaving EFCC, but now calling Nigerians generally, is how each sector of Nigeria can begin to see how we can play our part. I remember when China some years ago did a documentary on the police college in, um, in Lagos. We remember the outcry that happened. But of course, that was what Nigerians needed to see that time. What about if lawyers like um, Barrister Evans there is saying, he's giving us details of how uh, the constitution ensures that the federal government gives us the delivery. But what about some group of lawyers coming together to put pressure, taking government if possible to court, to ensure that they deliver on their promises? What about if every blue chip company in Nigeria is ensured that their corporate social responsibility is a must apart from paying tax? into the system. Recently, I was doing what I call an algorithm of numbers concerning how we can begin to raise funds to put um, critical infrastructures in place, for example, like water. I can tell you that over, um, almost everybody in Nigeria now, they are digging their boreholes. But yet, water board remains a big cash cow for Nigeria. For example, if water board um, can deliver water to 100 million Nigerians in a country of 202 um, uh, million, just 100 million, whether um, organizations, whether homes, and ensures that we have a flat rate of 2,000 naira that must be paid every month. Let's do the math. How much would that be for every month? How much would that be in a quarter? How much would that be in a year? Because everybody must use water, by the way. Okay? Now, I also notice that if we can start collecting start talking, having a conversation around putting pressure on the government system in ensuring that we get what we need. Something will happen. But one of the things we need to, uh, um, to situate, and that clearly now, that a moral crusade must begin to be started in Nigeria. We can't continue like this. Because when I look at what is happening, why would police not be on the road and sometimes they give you suggestive uh, 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 glances or ask you funny questions? Go to their start, um, barracks. What you see, you know that these people are in serious pain. Recently, we went around some universities in Nigeria training them. You know what we discovered? A state where a lot of Nigerian universities, from evening to night, are in pitch darkness. I think maybe some journalists or investigative journalists should go around Nigeria and do that kind of um, investigation. What does that mean? How will those students study in the night? What about their security? Nobody is doing anything about that. So for me, I think we have reached a, a situation in Nigeria where we must all pause and now let government, let new political holders, let new political parties who are agitating to come up with a development plan. And not only with a development plan, we the demand that that development plan will be held on an accountability basis every single month. The House of Assembly are doing a fantastic job, but I feel that it's really time for them to really sit up because they also apply the same roads that we are talking about in Nigeria. Okay. I see situations where we build roads in Nigeria and yet they are not gutters, they are not drainages. So that system has to stop. We need to now start talking to our systems, especially like the judiciary system. Lawyers, it's time for them to come up and start putting, taking people to court if possible to make sure that they okay. do Totugu. what they Totugu. need to do. Because okay. the truth is that we cannot continue. Okay, I need to bring this to um, Ufeli to talk to us about consequence management system. Do wrong, you're punished. Do right, you're rewarded. But before you do that, he may said something. A water board, yeah. um, water board, which is or water works, which is in every state of the federation, gives water to a hundred million Nigerians across the country at a flat rate yeah. of two thousand naira. So I did a multiplication. When you have 12 zeros against a figure, what's that? Is that zillion or trillion? Zillion. zillion. That's two zillion a month. Flat rate, 2,000 naira every month for 100 million. Okay. That is two, two zillion. Whatever. Or whatever. Now, That's, let me, let me, before you continue many. dreaming. Start with only 20 million. Now, before you continue dreaming, my former estate, 
built by LSGPC in a shady north in your neighborhood. We had uh, about 250 apartments, as in flats, duplexes in that mm. place. Each one has a borehole. And for me, that is ecological disaster we waiting to, to happen. happen. It will happen. I'm not prophesying, but I can tell you it will happen. It's a matter of time. The question now is, is anybody thinking ahead of when that will happen? No. As I said off camera, we have two basic problems. Our value system has been completely eroded. That's one number two. The phenomenon of no consequence, i.e. elsewhere, if you can do the crime, you will go and do the time. But hey, people brazenly, openly commit all manner of atrocities in Nigeria and they will get away with it. Okay, Mr. Fele, is it that our constitution, again, back to the constitution, some people say the constitution is messed up as well. As the constitution is, is it not a tool for consequence management? Does it not cover do good, you're rewarded, do bad, you're punished? Saying, the problem, the problem is, well, it, it, as it is. As it is. I mean, most of the time people say, uh, go and throw the constitution away. The constitution is this, the constitution is that. And that the constitution lie again says, say, with the rule. It's actually with the rule. Because that constitution has been there operating, operating right from 1960 to 63 Republican constitution to 79, and then to uh, where we are. And then it is not a constitution that is as bad as people think. I just pointed something out now that the constitution has already restructured. We are sitting in our restructure. So I don't know where we're going. But if you look at other subsidiary legislations, our criminal code and the penal code that regulates uh, criminal activities in the north and in the south, respectively, have made adequate and copious provision for penalty when you have this kind of offenses. Okay. Um, our our um, criminal jurisprudence, our criminal justice system also um, is there to interpret that level of uh, compliance. But what we have here is that when a person commits an offense, for example, maybe uh, uh, a, a big man, a big man or what you call it in Nigerian parlance, commits an offense, somebody writes a petition. Recently, there's a petition now before the EFCC concerning one of the elites in Nigeria who supposedly uh, had uh, issues of uh, funds uh, that could be time money laundry. And then some activists wrote petition and then have uh, sent to the EFCC. The petition is still there. EFCC have not acted. That's the same EFCC that uh, uh, Tochuku uh, is referring to. Okay, <laughs> they've not acted. The, the EFCC boss himself uh, is still acting to date because mm -hmm. we do not believe in our laws. Uh, uh, the, the National Assembly, eight, eight, Ninth Assembly, Eighth Assembly kicked against his confirmation. Mm. He's mm. still there acting. When you have legislations that you don't have faith in, when the president swore to an oath to defend the Constitution, uh, the first four years, he was unable to defend the Constitution. He was given a second time to come back. I, I want to take it from the top. Because this, let's hit it from where it's really, it's really happening. Now, if you have not been able to defend the constitution, that is to say, you, you travel, you not transmit power, that is violating, that is gross misconduct. We should have a strong national assembly that should go ahead to impeach. And do, do impeach. The heavens will not for impeach. When we do that, you see that these big men, they are not as strong as we think. They are not as strong as we think. It's because of that level of laxity. The, the masses, the institutions are weak. The people are weak. Everybody's weak. So, so in other words, we what, have what a have, consequence management system, we but do. we are not following it through. We do, but we're not following it through. Okay, if somebody commits an offense, and then it gets to the police station, the police abandons the fact of the case, and they're asking you to go and bring the money that you took from that person. Bring you come and come and drop it just because they are going to take ten percent of it. Do you know that police take ten percent of if, for example, somebody took my funds away and I take him to a police station, 
He's supposed to go and pay the money at the police station and then sign, and then there will be a bond <coughs> and all that to release and all that. You know the police take 10% from that? They take it from it. It is illegal. The police, I say the police have no business. The police have no business with money. They are not accountants. They are supposed to rely on, they, they are paid to do a job. They should rely on that. So if, if the police that is even supposed to do the arrest and start the process of prosecution have issues themselves, are we talking about the consequences? What will become the, the penalty that will stand as deterrent? I mean, the people who are finally convicted are people who possibly uh, things went against them and then they could not afford to pay. Yeah, yeah, could not afford to pay or whatever. And, and then it happens like that. Or sometimes it's just by stroke of luck, the nation is able to prosecute somebody truly and all that. So these are issues that we must talk okay. about. Okay, let me ask um, oh Digbo. Um, <laughs> super kind of breed says the only problem in Nigeria is simple decision. But he says, if the government decides to make Nigeria work, forget it. All these issues will be stopped. It's just a matter of the government deciding to do what's necessary. They have better experts and data to make better decisions. Is it about the government? I think it's about the government and the people together. Uh, because like, um, we like this language in Nigeria, political will or body language. I still don't understand what body language has to do with, in, with governance. But like I said, the people also have a role to play. Because, I mean, like we mentioned earlier at the beginning of the program, that even some of the infrastructure that have been handed down to the people, I mean, there are some neighborhoods that have legitimate drain <coughs> systems, okay? But you have people going there to dump refuse, okay? So you dump the refuse, the whole drainage system is clogged, and then the water floods the road, that they managed to fix for you, and now because there's water on the road, the entire road is bad. So the people and the government, so going back to the mental infrastructure that we're talking about, I think that is, that is the hallmark of it all. Either the government is, is lacking in will, or the people are lacking in, 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 in carrying out their duties, their responsibilities as citizens, responsible citizens of the republic. I think it still goes back to our mentality, knowing that, you know what, this, I have, I have a sense of ownership to this. This drainage is in front of my house. It should be cleared, okay? Because if it is not cleared, it will damage the road. But why would you leave your bin in the house and then come to the road when it's raining and then you dump your pet bottles and all your trash in there? So the people also have a role to play. But like we have been saying, <coughs> The mental infrastructure is important because you would also agree with me that these people want are a product of a system. And um, for some reason, maybe in four to eight to 12 years, those same people will find their way into some level of the government and they will still go ahead with that same mentality. And then they get there and then they can't affect any meaningful change. So I think that um, our mentality as a people, and that brings the question, what's the job of the National Orientation Agency? We've been asking this question for a while. What are they doing as an agency, as an institution, as a body of government? What's, are they clear on their charter at all? Because we're not really seeing them do as much as we expect them to do. Now, we're having a huge breakdown in our value system as a people. Where's the NOA? Well, there are different issues that they need to be solved at the, the perception level, at the intellectual level, at the mental level. We're not seeing the NOA. What are they doing about it? They're not vocal. They're just there earning salaries on our taxes, and they're not getting the job done. So that still goes to the part of, okay, where's the part of oversight? Who is in charge of that ministry? Who's saying, or that agency? Which ministry is in charge of that agency? And is the minister saying, okay, you know what? What are your deliverables? What have you been able to do? First quarter, second quarter, this is the last quarter of this year, 2019. What have you been able to do? What have you been able to achieve? What message have you been able to pass across? When you pass the message across, how have you been able to measure the impact of that message in the lives of the people? So I think that until we understand that um, the lives of people here aren't to be gambled with, um, we won't see the effective change that we're looking for in this country. Yeah, Mr. Rio, we, you know, when we, many times when we talk about these things, especially mental infrastructure, value system, we always go to, again, you talked about it, political will. But the question also is the politicians come from the citizenry. Mm. Now, some of them used to be civil servants. Some of them used to be in different... Yes, 
some of them are professionals, accomplished professionals. Some used to be in the military. Some in the security security apparatus of the country. So they they are coming from everywhere into the political class. But at the end of the day, we still have more citizens. We still have more civil servants than there are politicians. How do we get this infrastructure to work? Again, the four, we talked about four types of infrastructure. Physical, social, institutional, and mental. In fact, let's switch it. Mental yeah, and then us. What I would like you to know, the most important of all of this is the mental. When you look at the amount of money some people stole, you begin to query their sanity. So what are they going to be doing with this kind of money? Even if they are going to be living in 10 lifetimes, there is no way they will exhaust the money. Okay? And then you, there was, I was with somebody one day, he got a letter to paint a house. Okay, letter of award to paint a house. He was already given a check. By the time we got to the site, it was uncleared. No house had been built. And somebody wow. awarded the contract. So I was now asking the man, what will you now do? He said, what will he do? And those who gave him the job already expecting their percentage. Yeah, sure. You know, so these are the questions you continue asking yourself. Why? That's why I said that our problems are those two. to get those kinds of <laughs> <laughs> We have those two problems. Problem of value. Okay? And of course, the, the problem of no consequence. If we can get those two right, and we we'll run Nigeria as a business, okay, as a business that must make profit. Now, what profit are we making? Mm. Good governance, whereby there will be power, there will be water, the roads will be good, the schools will be good. If you know how much we spend on foreign exchange, paying school fees in places as, let me not use the word now, even in Benin Republic, we have more of our people pursuing degrees in okay. container universities mm. in the Republic. Now, why would they not go there? Well, what we have here is far from the ideal. I know you're yeah. not literally talking about container universities. There are container <laughs> universities in Benin that run from container, as in all those 20 foot down 40 you see on the road. They are, if you doubt me, let's take a drive down. You will see with your eyes. And then the quality of what they transmit as education also best common sense. But why won't our people go there when here what we have is not enough? You know? hmm. And I still said it on the panel yesterday not, that not, not we are graduating people into unemployment. Okay? Our trans labors is overdue for a review, complete review, whereby it will be made relevant, not just to the present, but to the future as well. But I said this, and you know, you know what? I'm afraid of him. Anytime I meet him, he's always very blunt and direct. He brooks no nonsense. I mean, you, you heard the way he was explaining those, all these things using the Constitution. Whereas the go there and tell you, it's not about the Constitution, it's about the people. And he like, so it's in us. Let's just say that the best time to start. Is now. now. Okay, Professor just hold your Nakana break. Says, hold your thoughts. Okay, you want to. Um, we need to first invest in human capital development. This is the panacea needed to trigger economic and fiscal infrastructure development. Recurrent expenditure is crippling the economy. Of course. It is not aligned for a concrete investment in capital sector, which is infrastructure. We'll be back in a moment. Join us again. Mm. Thank you for staying with us. We've been looking at the infrastructure, state of infrastructure in the country. We looked at four kinds of infrastructure, mental, physical, social, and institutional infrastructure. Now, Festus Akimbo was sent in a tweet. He says, money answered all things. In the, all of this conversation, nobody has touched on the aspect of funding in this debate. And these are, these are our closing moments. I'll start with Mr. Evans. From there, we'll go all the way to Abuja and we'll end, end with Mr. Ario as we close. Evans, we start with you. The question of funding. And you know you're the Constitution man. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is project, the Constitution. Uh, project financing is very, very critical. It's very important because after all said and done, you have to finance projects. Okay, so uh, what can we do to finance public infrastructure 
adequately in Nigeria. Let's cut down on wastages. Let's cut down on wastages. And then let's investigate proper the people we award contracts to and the people who inflict these contracts. Because uh, sometimes we think that uh, uh, the projects aren't available because they have been depleted by population. But most of the times it's because the projects are not quality projects. Okay? They are not quality projects. I mean, Lagos Ibadra Expressway have been under construction since 1999. Since 1998, because that was the first time I went there. Repair, no construction, repairs. Yes. So you understand. So if we have a system that guarantees for quality jobs, I think that will aid uh, our issue. Then the issue of financing or the issue of taking loans, okay? If you take loans to fund public infrastructure, I think that's okay. But here we take loans and then the, the, the money is embezzled. And then we are building debts. We are building debts, we are, we are sharing money and all that. I think we should work on that. Then most importantly, we should finance the local government. You see, this attitude of governors taking local government um, allocation and putting in their pocket should stop. No, but did we not hear we, that that practice freed. had stopped? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. went directly yeah. to the local government. Yes, just, just recently. Yes. Just recently. But still, we haven't Even seen like that. We haven't seen seen the just, just recently, but we have not followed up that story to find out how many local government now have received direct and what have they done with what it. they have received. Has okay. it made any difference? Yes, so because when we're talking about financing, we have to look at all the variables from where we get from our location mm. and then from what can be generated. And the federal government should be sincere with this issue of VAT. Because this VAT is a whole lot of money. It's a whole lot of money. And the money they said they recovered from looters, we don't know how much it is. We don't know where they are deploying it to. <laughs> Why are they saying actually? Because this financing thing, I, I, think, I think somewhere in my mind that we have the money to fund our project. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Because if you look at, if you look at custom, you look at the monies they've re recovered. I mean, federal government have recovered through the EFCC. You look at uh, VAT. You look at um, the, the sale of crude oil and then what we get. And then you look at the level of uh, allocation. I believe we can fund our projects. Well, maybe it's because we're not declaring everything that, that comes. Well, we don't know the figures. <laughs> we don't know the figures. So, I mean, there should be transparency and all that so that we can know the figures and know exactly what it is we can do with the level of funding of this project. And I have a Nigeria that works. Well, Nigeria disappoints me. I'm, I'm telling you. Big boy. <laughs> Big boy. Okay, well, I'll, I'll look at it from uh, two perspectives, where we get the funds from and how we disperse them. One. Like he, I mean, he's already stated the sources, but I'd like to add this to it, cutting down the cost of governance. We have been saying this every other day. The cost to look at that of governance. Haven't you noticed? I think we, until, until, until they're, they're ready to look at that. I mean, you need to look inward first before you start looking on the outside. And I think if we're being sincere about getting this country to actually work, we need to cut down the cost of governance. I think it is obscene, it is absurd, that a Nigerian senator should go home annually with a million dollars. It is obscene. What's, what, let's, let's not even get into are we getting value for our money. That's a different conversation. But comparatively, saying that the President of the United States, I mean, someone who has access to nuclear launch codes and all sorts of... Yes. So, and um, the people in his country have said, okay, you know what, for all of that you're doing, your annual salary is $400,000. I mean, Trump just got $500,000. Obama was getting, I think, half of that with the same responsibilities. So that, begs to, that, that, that brings to mind or begs the question that where are we going exactly? Are we actually sincere about getting this country to work? Because it's until we... Money we say we don't have. Now, saying we don't have. So first, we need to save from that perspective, from that angle. Mm -hmm. We need to save a huge amount of money. Then adding it to the other resources it's talked about. I mean, the Abacha loot has been coming in every other day. We're not getting a clear, <coughs> a clear expression of where the money is actually going to. The Paris Club Fund, we heard that was disbursed, but we haven't heard anything again about it. We're not asking these questions, and we're saying we're broke. I think it is a bit um, insincere 
And I think it is, it is a bit um, frightening that um, these things go by and then we don't get to talk about it, even as a people. Mm -hmm. I think we need to do better, even as a people, asking these questions, asking the people at the National Assembly, State Houses of Assembly, even the local government, because we talked about the local government uh, chairman. Ask these questions. We should hold them accountable. We understand the some were detained. Some of them in the, I think in one of the states were detained um, for, for misappropriating. Yeah, yeah, for, for misappropriating misappropriating funds. Yeah, so I think we need to see a lot of that happen across the country, across the length and breadth of this country, because I think it is it is quite unfair. Because I mean we have, and unfortunately there's uh, I've been on various media platforms as well, and I've come to find this study to be true. For every local government office, look within a kilometer radius of it. There's a huge pothole around there. I mean, very, very bad road. Either the either the curb is completely gone, or uh, the covert is even really bad, or there's a serious pothole that can swallow an entire car. Please, you can you can go check that out. Okay, and I think I think I, th I think and I think it's it is it is a bit absurd, really, because this is the road that the local government chairman. Passes. Passes. Okay. Staff of the local government office live in areas that they need to use canals. So I ask myself, when you get to the office and then um, for some reason maybe you had to wade through water at knee level and then you have your trousers rolled up, you have your shoes on your armpit, you have your bag on your head and then you get to the office eventually and then you're sweating and then people ask, oh, what happened that you're rinsing your leg with water and then you have to say, oh, okay, this is what happened. They have that conversation at the office. Local government chairman passes through that road. And no, the chairman has, probably doesn't live, live in the local yes, government. He do, yes, he doesn't. He, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't live there, but the he takes. He lives in Banana. Yes, he's, he's probably <laughs> Chief Aria's <laughs> neighbor. <laughs> he's Chief Aria's <laughs> neighbor. But somehow he gets to the office through that road, and nothing brings in anyone's head that something should be done about this. Do they go to the offices? This goes at the distributing power. Okay, well, have you gone to some of the offices? And the generator. The generator there. And they are the ones that are supposed <laughs> to be supposed to uh, so, so, so it still goes back to the mental okay. infrastructure. Let's have a huge to go. <laughs> that we need to do on that. Toshiko, over to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. all right. So for me, I, I wouldn't want to even put too much emphasis on the financing because I know clearly that we can get it right with financing. Like I was trying to even talk about the water board. Currently, even in the FCT here, the water board will not give you your monthly bills till after four months. When um, telecom companies came in, one of the last entrants, which was Etisalat, in less than a year, they had already raised close to 40 million, subs uh, 40 million subscribers. So if that is telecoms, I can tell you that we can even get it even for basic needs. But I want to leave the issue of financing because if we don't get the issue of the moral character or the moral crusade or the, um, the, the, the values that need to uphold us to make sure that we manage the resources we get towards delivering for the citizens, we are not going to get it right. So for me, I just think we should leave the financing. It is there. Institutional bodies are there. The World Banks are there. The African Development Bank is there. The Bank of Infrastructure in Nigeria is there. All those infrastructures, the PENCOM, they are there. So for me, that's not the problem. So can we face government where they can give us pet people New wine, new wine skins, if it is possible. This is a government of progressive. And one of the things that progressive are known for is that they care for people. We cannot look at what is happening in floods all over Nigeria. It's happening in Adama, it's already happening in Abuja, it's happening in Lagos, almost all, every part of Nigeria. So now the government needs to give us a, 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 a hope for why we elected them as progressive. And in case they don't, another group of persons if they have the moral integrity to come up with a development plan for Nigeria, that we can hold them accountable so that if they come to government, it's all about what they're going to do. Look at what is happening in Rwanda. That man has the moral integrity and the people believe in him and the people do anything to ensure that their country is physically clean. Then the second um, um, set of people I want to go to is the citizens. For me, I think that the citizens of Nigeria are becoming too tolerant Look at that young man in that documentary you showed, strolling through um, the water and he was singing. That's to tell you what um, a social reformer, Ladi Thompson, said about that. When you go to any society, he, had, he calls something the um, architecture of thought. That when you see how the society is formed, how they build their bridges, how the people move, how the people say things and do things in that society, it tells you the thinking of that group of people there. Now let us come and bring 
to Nigeria, the architecture of thoughts that we have here in Nigeria, you will now notice that the citizens are, are laxed. And like the barristers say, everybody is weak. The institutions are weak, the people are weak, and I'm asking, so when are we going to get it right? So I think it's time for the citizens to begin to stand up and demand for what is theirs. There's nothing that the political leadership will hear until they begin to hear the outrage of the citizens. After all, they elected them. And like you rightly said, they come from among the people. So this is time where both the government should give us progressive de um, dividends. The people also put a lot of demand. And so when I'm talking about the people, I'm beginning to talk about people who have hybrid solutions to, to what we're doing in Nigeria, okay? multidisciplinary case approach in how we can deal with what we're having in Nigeria. Because for me, the financing is really not the problem. We may allocate money again, and before you know what's happening, it's misappropriated. And like um, uh, Mr. Um, Elder Ario said there, there will be no consequence. So we need to create a society where the matter of consequence, the matter of the values that we uphold, for example, look at our national anthem that say, I pledge to Nigeria, my country. country. All right. Nigeria. Thank you, Tochigo. Thank you, Tochigo. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Ario, you have less than one minute. <laughs> okay, I'll try and be quick with it. Nigeria is not poor. Nigeria as a country is not poor. I refuse to believe or accept that, and I know it. That's why, number two, the worst lie you can ever believe with our experience here, which I've been a part of for almost 60 years of being alive, is that democracy is the goal of the people for the people by the people. So the people got to wake up. I'm not advocating for crisis revolution. or revolution. No. Hmm. If all you can do is to speak, offer solutions, don't just condemn, which in the last, uh, how many minutes now, we've been doing here. Yeah. Because we are never lacking in grandiose ideas and projects, but execution. Now they're talking of uh, vision for under 30 years. And I ask, what happened to all the previous visions? Now, this is coming now to forestall the failure, which is going to be the, the, the lot of Vision 2020, a few months away from here. Now, the people in your impoverished state <laughs> arise, speak, bring forth solution, and in your corner be the change that, that you, you are looking see. for. All right, thank you very much. So let me quickly read this other contribution from people before we go. Victor sent in, say, a, a post from Thursday. It said, lawyers protest bad roads in Nogun State. Um, that's from Victor. Professor Imonokai Eneken says, Man mismanagement of resources and systemic corruption by our leaders who have hydrochondriac tendencies, they cannot stop financial banditry because they are career criminals or political <laughs> bandits. Good <laughs> governance is the key and a must to create infrastructural development. Before you read Festus, let me read this one again. He says, government at all levels have abdicated their responsibilities to blame games. How many people have been imprisoned for corruption? How many of our politicians have ever been jailed for fraud? If we strengthen our institutions, it will become impregnable with corruption. Why don't you read Festus? Um, <clears throat> Investors. How can we fund our projects? UK is spending £600 billion to develop the infrastructure in 10 years. Well, he didn't tell us how they were doing it. Just, uh, just told us how much. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, we've had Tochuku Ihemene, who's a social commentator, join us from our Abuja studio. Mr. Cho, sorry, Chief Olade Indeario is a public affairs analyst who's moved to Banana. What's I don't know which do Banana. Um, <laughs> Mr. Dick Boyewale is a public affairs analyst. And Evans Ufeli is a legal practitioner. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Summarize, we'll be back in a moment. Please stay with us. <laughs>